Finally, for today, um, I would like to give you one last example. And uh, again, that's uh, something we will need when proving inversion formulas for the radon transform. And uh, that's the Hilbert transform. And to get to the Hilbert transform, let me first define the uh, distribution T of phi. That's in some way the T1 over x. So that's the distribution that belongs to the function 1 over x. So it should be something like integral over r phi of x phi of x over x dx. The problem is that this is not integrable at zero. So we resort to taking out symmetric shares around zero. So we uh, um, look at the integral of x, um, absolute value of x larger than epsilon, phi of x over x dx, and uh, let epsilon go to zero. And I claim that uh, this uh, limiting value exists. And uh, I define this as this one over here. And it's also known under the name of Cauchy principal value. Um, probably you all know it, but uh, let me first show that uh, the limiting value in fact exists. And uh, well, um, existence at infinity is no problem because phi of x decays as fast as you want if, f, uh, if uh, phi is in s. So what about the integra <laughs> integrability at zero? So uh, let's take uh, the share from minus one to one. So let's uh, take the integral from um, um, from minus one to one, and uh, but x uh, absolute value of x larger than epsilon. So that's the integral epsilon smaller than x uh, absolute value of x smaller than one phi of x dx. And by the way, I should say that, of course, this is, of course, this is all now in, in the real numbers, right? I mean, that uh, otherwise x would not make, um, over x would not make too much sense. Okay, we look at this and um, I subtract a phi of zero up here. Now that doesn't make a difference uh, because one over x is uh, um, an odd function. And so phi, over, phi of zero over x is also an odd function. So the integral over, the, uh, over this symmetric uh, integral is zero, is zero. And uh, so subtracting that doesn't make any difference. However, now we have phi of x minus phi of zero over x. That's uh, the, um, so that's phi prime of uh, psi of x, where psi of x is uh, some value between zero of x. And uh, now this is limited by uh, the um, infinity norm of phi prime. So this is smaller or equal to twice times the infinity norm of phi prime. So this is, um, so this is finite and so the integral exists. Okay, good. Um, now, uh, to get a nicer, a little bit nicer expression for that, I define the function f epsilon, f epsilon as one over x, but uh, um, the symmetric share around uh, zero, I set it to zero. And uh, so this is the definition over here. And uh, now we get the nice representation that t of phi is the uh, limiting value of epsilon going to zero integ integral over rn f epsilon of x phi of x dx. We know that it exists. That's what we proved over here. And uh, if we look at f epsilon, uh, then uh, definitely that's integrable at zero because it's zero there. And it's also integrable at infinity since it behaves like one over x squared. Uh, the, the square behaves like one over x squared, so it's integrable. So in fact, that function is in L2. And that means that also its Fourier transform exists in the usual sense and that it's also in L2. Now let's try to compute that Fourier transform. And uh, then we, um, using the definition, we have f epsilon hat of xi is one over square root of two pi. And uh, inserting the definition of f, we have this integral uh, um, um, absolute value of x larger than epsilon one over x e to the minus ix xi dx. Uh, 
Now, the, the problem is that uh, one over x, of course, is not an L1. So this integral over here doesn't exist. But uh, since it's in L2, and we know that uh, the, um, the Fourier transform of L2 functions exist in the sense that every uh, L2 function can be approximated by a, by, um, by a series of um, L1 functions, and then the corresponding L1 Fourier transforms converge, and this is uh, the, that's the value of this integral over here. So that's the meaning of this integral here. I mean, it doesn't in, uh, actually exist, but uh, approximating one over x uh, by a series of um, functions that converge uh, to one over x, um, that, that, that limit exists, right? And that's the value that we need here. And that's the that's the usual way of extending the L1 definition of the Fourier transform to L2. Okay, um, now since uh, the um, writing the e to the minus ix xi as cosine plus i times the sine, uh, one over x is an odd function, so the um, even parts in this uh, in, um, in this part over here in, in this exponential go away, so the cosine goes away, and uh, all that's left is the sine. So this is the same as minus i over square root of 2 pi. And uh, now we have just the sine left over here. Now we replace x by x over xi. Uh, then this becomes sine of x over x. And uh, um, um, over x times xi times the absolute value of xi. And... Um, yeah, there's an absolute value of xi over xi. That's the sine of xi, and uh, that's what I've written down here, right? That was the integration constant. Okay, then we have that minus i square root over 2 pi. Oh, yeah, and I already let epsilon go to zero. Everything, um, con uh, everything is fine. This one converges over here, so uh, that goes to this integral over here. Now, um, I said this, um, yeah. Um, now, that what I have here is now, by definition, the inverse Fourier transform of the sinc function evaluated at zero, right? I mean, that would be something like integral over r sine of x over x times e to the e times zero times x uh, dx, so that would be one. So that's the inverse. What we have here is the inverse Fourier transform of the x of the of the sinc function evaluated at zero. Uh, now we know what the inverse for um, what the <laughs> inverse Fourier transform of the sinc is. It's the characteristic function from minus one to one up to some constants. And doing everything right, we find that this is minus i times pi over two square root of pi over two times the sine of xi because the characteristic function of minus one, uh, minus pi pi, um, uh, minus one one, excuse me, minus one one evaluated at zero is one. Okay, good. Now, um, um, next I want to compute the Fourier transform of that operator T, which I defined up, up here. So t hat of phi is the same as t of phi hat. And that's the limiting value for epsilon going to zero. Integral over rn f epsilon of x phi hat of x dx. That's exactly the definition that I had. Now that's the same as uh, due to Parseval. This is the same of f, f, f epsilon hat times, f, times phi over here. So we can exchange the, uh, uh, the hat from, from one function to the other one. That was Parseval. And um, now we interchange. Now we exchange the um, order of integra uh, uh, integration and taking the limit over here, and we find that integral over R n limits uh, limiting value of epsilon going to zero f epsilon hat of x times phi of x dx. Now, but this one we already computed. Uh, that's more or less the sine of x uh, times that constant over here. So plugging that in, we find that uh, um, for epsilon going to zero, this is minus i square root pi over two integral over rn sine of x phi of x dx. 
And we know that all of this has to be, has to exist uh, because the Fourier transform for a two, L2 function is well defined. Okay, good. Um, so what does this mean in a sense? Well, um, the, um, the T which we had over here, the distribution T, where is it? Ah, yeah. The distribution T that we had, no, it's not this one. Um, here, right. That's, that's why I had to find T. Somehow that uh, T is uh, the function one over X only, the definition of the integral over here is a little bit different. So that can be identified with uh, the function one over, T can be identified with the function one over X. So in a sense, we have proved that the Fourier transform of one over X is minus I times square root of pi over two times the sine. Okay, uh, where the definition of uh, the normal definition of the integral has to be replaced by the Cauchy principal value, but that means that everything stays right. Okay, now let's finally define the Hilbert transform. Let f any function in S, and then we define the Hilbert transform, which is a function from uh, from uh, it's a function from S to S, I would say. Yeah, it's a function from S to S. Yeah, it's a function from S to S. And um, so um, we define H F at a point X as one over pi times the Cauchy principal value of F of Y over X minus Y dy. So, uh, it now, this one now has its pole, uh, it's not integrable at x, and uh, everything is defined as before, but uh, this time we're leaving out the space around x, symmetric shares around x. Okay, so writing this as a convolution, again now with a Cauchy principal value instead of the normal integral, we have that this is 1 over pi times, oops, 1 over pi times the convolution of f and 1 over x evaluated at x. Okay, and now using the convolution theorem, we have that uh, the Fourier transform of hf evaluated at xi is 1 over pi times, well, we want to um, apply the convolution theorem, so, so that's 1 over x hat times f hat, and we get that constant of 2 pi over 1 half. And doing everything right, getting the constants right, we find that all the constants um, get out. And this is nothing but minus i times the sine of xi times f hat of xi. So more or less what the Hilbert transform does is in the Fourier domain, it it multiplies the Fourier coefficients or the Fourier transform by minus by by the sine uh, of xi, and this is going to be a very useful operator when we look at the radon transform. <laughs>